Hello friends, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture on IFRS. This is going to be the part 2 of uh, our lecture series on international financial reporting standards. In the previous lecture, I told you uh, briefly about what was there into the practice before IFRS. We, we talked about IAS that is international accounting standards. We talked about IASC that is international accounting standard committee and now we will tell you about uh, you know uh, the standards what has changed into the IFRS that I will be telling you in this part 2 of our lectures, uh, lecture series on international financial reporting standard. So, we will try to understand what is there into IFRS. So, I ended uh, you know the previous lecture with the discussion on uh, you know NACAS and NFRA that is National Advisory Committee on Accounting Standard and National Financial uh, you know reporting authority. You know uh, what was different uh, what is different with that of NFRA? NACAS was not having any you know regulatory rights they were not having any right to regulate uh, you know the implementation of standards whereas NFRA the present uh, national financial reporting authority it actually aims to monitor and enforce the compliance with accounting and auditing standards. So, their objective is to ensure the quality of services provided by professionals. So, suppose what if our chartered accountants who are working what if their quality of service is compromised. So, they have to monitor, they are actually there to monitor to regulate the quality of service also, which was earlier performed by you know uh, ICAI also, because cause they were they, they issue certificate of practice to uh, you know uh, their chartered accountants, those who are practicing chartered accountants, they behave, uh, they act as auditors, as an auditor uh, to different companies. So, quality of service which is provided by professionals that also comes under purview of uh, the regulatory uh, rights of NFRA. Along with that, you know, they will actually be monitoring the compliance with the standards and the measures required for improvement in the quality of reporting. So, their objective is to actually, you know, ensure, you know, the metamorphical uh, change into the reporting regime because by merely setting up the standards, it will not, you know, uh, serve our purpose unless it is implemented in, uh, in true spirit, in right spirit. So, that is more important, uh, you know, for us and, and to which government actually paid uh, this much of heed that they thought of, you know, uh, coming up with the new, uh, you know, organizations which is having, you know, uh, you know, aggressive, you know, rights or you can say which is having genuine rights. I would say they people call it aggressive right, but I actually believe that this was very much needed. It is not aggressive unless you monitor and enforce the compliance with the accounting standard unless you monitor it there is no point you know simply setting up the standards giving interpretations there is no point you know uh, uh, saying that we have now implemented it. You have not implemented you have simply prescribed. So, unless you monitor unless you uh, you know regulate you cannot understand whether it has been implemented or not and with that motive uh, you know we got a new uh, entity called NFRA. So, my dear learners, you need to understand the very, uh, you know, uh, genesis of, you know, journey from NACAS to now uh, NFRA. Now, when we talk about introduction to Indian accounting standard, they are actually, you know, if you talk about IFRS, uh, you know, for India, the name for IFRS in India is not IFRS, it is abbreviated as IND-AS. So, IND I -N -D stands for India and AS stands for accounting standards. So, if somebody is asking you what is IFRS in India, you would say that it is in AS because Indian accounting standards that is actually the name for IFRS in India. Now, before we proceed to the comparative analysis of what was there into erstwhile international accounting standard, what was there into AS that is accounting standard and now what is there into IFRS and corresponding to that what uh, in AS we have. We need to first learn what is the road map to NDS, what is there into uh, the way we have implemented uh, you know this NDS in our country. So, I told you in the previous lecture that ICAI decided to come up with this uh, you know road map from 2011, but it was halted due to some reasons uh, and we should not uh, go into the details of that, why it was halted, who was responsible to that. So, let us come to the point what is the road map to NDS. On April 1, 2015, you know they announced with the voluntary adoption that any company which is willing uh, you know which is feeling like implementing or, or adopting uh, to the NDS they, they were free to adopt it. But it was voluntary there was no you know uh, pressure on any of the company if some companies were finding it uh, you know ok with them that they are prepared to implement it it is good it is all ok they can adopt. 
but from April 1, 2016. Now, you will be understanding that you know in our country it is not implemented overnight. We have moved gradually. So, on April 1, 2016, in a phased manner, what government decided that there shall be a mandatory adoption by companies whose net worth is rupees 500 crore or more. So, any company whose net worth is you know above this level that is rupees 500 crore or more then obviously for them it, it became mandatory with effect from April 1, 2016 which means we started from the big companies in terms of their size that any company whose net worth is, uh, uh, is rupees 500 crore or more it is supposed to adopt you know or, or, or adopt this NDS with effect from the financial statement of April 1, 2016 that is financial year 16-17. And remember, when when it was implemented for when it was uh, it was made mandatory for the companies having net worth of rupees five hundred crore or more, then it was also made applicable to their holding subsidiary, joint venture, or associates of uh, you know such companies. So any company which is associated with the you know uh, such big companies having net worth of rupees five hundred crore or more, then obviously if you are holding if you are uh, you know their holding company or you are subsidiary to that or you are a joint venture or associate of that company in any manner, for you also the same is the deadline that is April 1, 2016. So, it was implemented, uh, it was made mandatory for bigger companies initially. Now, in the next year what happened from April 1, 2017, it was again made mandatory for unlisted companies having net worth of rupees 250 crore or more. So, any company which is having net worth of rupees 250 crore or more, they were you know supposed to adopt you know this uh, uh, NDS with effect from April 1, 2017. And again the same was the condition that it shall be applicable to companies with net worth of less than 500 crores whose equity or debt securities are listed in India or outside India. So, in 2017 it was made mandatory for unlisted companies, but along with that it was also you know uh, applicable to companies with a net worth of less than rupees 500 crore. So, earlier it was for rupees 500 crore or more and now it is less than rupees 500 crore. So, anywhere if it is then obviously you know uh, 250 crore or more and if it is a listed company and its value is less than 500 crore. So, obviously since your equity or debt securities are listed either in Indian stock market or outside India then for you also for them also it was made mandatory that they have to comply with the NDS with effect from April 1, 2017 which means from the financial year 17-18 they have to abide by the provisions laid down in NDS. Moving ahead the roadmap for implementation of Indian accounting standard for commercial banks. You know it was uh, you know a long debated issue when, when uh, you know we started talking about implementing IFRS in India or we talked about you know forming NDS or converging with the IFRS. This was actually a debated issue that for banking sector it is very difficult to implement and that is why it, it was actually given huge time. It was given, given you know uh, sufficient uh, you know time to implement it for the banking sector and there too it was implemented in a phased manner. So, the roadmap for implementation of you know in AS for commercial banks it was decided that for commercial banks, for insurance companies and for NBFCs that is non-banking financial corporations it was announced on January 18, 2016 and in that announcement you know uh, government actually came up with the implementation schedule for you know these uh, institutions, these, these type of organizations and it was decided that for banks initially they started with the bank. But when they talked about banks, they excluded urban cooperative banks and RRBs. What is RRB? RRBs are regional rural banks because they are small in size. So, initially they were ex excluded from the list of banks. So, excluding urban cooperative banks and regional rural banks. All banks, all India term lending, term lending refinancing institutions that is which included Exim Bank that is Export and Import Bank, NABARD and NHB that is National Housing Bank which is actually the 100 percent subsidiary of RBI and SIDB Small Industries Development Bank of India. So, they were you know it they were actually asked to adopt accounting standards for for the period you know starting commencing with effect from April 1, 2018. So, from 1819 
initially for the bigger banks because uh, it ex excluded urban cooperative banks and RRBs. It was made mandatory for them to adopt and later on for NBFCs with net worth of rupees 500 crore and more they were also asked to adopt accounting standards for uh, from the same date that is April 1, 2018. So, for the bigger NBFCs, those who were bigger in size in terms of their capital, for them it was made mandatory that with effect from April 1, 2018, they have to actually adopt, uh, you know, this in AS. Now, NBFCs which were smaller in size, which were listed or in the process of being listed and having net worth of less than rupees 500 crore, crore, they were asked to adopt it with effect from April 1, 2019. So, this was actually, you know, the roadmap for unlisted NBFCs uh, whose net worth was ranging between 250 crores to uh, 500 crores. For them also, the time was again 1st April 2019. They were asked to, to, you know, prepare their financial statements as per the format prescribed under NDAS. And for their holdings, subsidiary and joint ventures or associate companies, again, the time was the same, that is April 1, 2019. So, we can say that, uh, you know, uh, from with effect from April 1, 2019, IND AS, on, on that date, we could, uh, we can say that IND AS was implemented for all, you know, entities which are operating in India. If any entity is a profit making entity, it is implemented. Because banking sector was, if you, if you look at the roadmap, you will find that initially we started with a voluntary adoption, then mandatory for bigger companies, then making it mandatory for the smaller organizations. So that they should get sufficient time to prepare, you know, themselves. Because, of course, uh, this requires a lot of change into their softwares, into their procedures, into their internal control system. And, and even not only that. The accountants and auditors, they were also supposed, supposed to be trained for that. So, this time was actually on one hand, the standard was being developed and it was implemented because we did not adopt it as it is. We actually conversed with that. So, on one hand, regulator was busy into the preparation, uh, development of standards, getting all the legal approvals and on the other, they were actually working on capacity building. They were training their chartered accountants, they were training their, you know, auditors so that they should also, you know, be sensitized about uh, what is uh, going to be, uh, you know, the new uh, way of, you know, implementing our standards, what is going to be the new rule for the, uh, for this entire accounting profession. Now, I shall be providing a comparative summary of Indian accounting standard and IFRS so that you can understand because many a times my students are saying, because when, when I go in the class and teach statement of cash flow, earlier we were calling it cash flow statement. Now, I call it, uh, you know, uh, uh, statement of cash flow. So they, so, they ask me, sir, what is the difference? Either you call it cash flow statement or statement of cash flow. There is no difference. Yes, of course, there is no difference in terms of calculation, in terms of uh, their, their nature or objective. But yes, standard prescribes a new name now. Standard does not permit us to call it uh, cash flow statement. It says now you have to call it statement of cash flow. So, I will be telling you what is, what has, has, you know, changed till date, but till date a total of 39 in AS, I am, I am telling you in numbers, in numbers there are total 39, you know, in AS for different, uh, you know, problems for different purposes, they have been notified by Ministry of Corporate Affairs, you can go to their website, you will find it there and the same is available on the website of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India as well. And the last, you know, IND AS which has been developed, you know, that is IND AS number 41. This is for agriculture, which was very complex to, you know, develop and it is very interesting also. So, this is actually a brief about, you know, the, uh, the IND AS which is implemented in India because we have conversed with the IFRS. Now, I am providing you the comparative summary of, uh, you know, IAS and IFRS. So, if you look at the table, you will find that uh, I have initially, uh, you know, uh, written existing Indian standard. Then I have told you the corresponding IFRS number for that and then corresponding in AS number which we have implemented now and what is the, the heading of, what is the name of that converged IFRS that has been given. Although that I, I have not covered, I have not taken all the standards, but I have taken some of the important ones so that you should have an idea. You should have a fair idea about what is going on. If you look at AS1, AS1 which was earlier known as accounting standard number 1. Now, for this AS1, what we did, we took, you know, some clue from IAS that is international accounting standard and it was basically on disclosure of accounting policies. 
So, it demanded for you know uh, you, you know the corp demanded uh, you know from the companies to disclose their accounting policies in a requisite uh, you know format in a requisite manner and that was a standard. But corresponding IFRS number for this is this was actually IAS 1. So, we were having AS 1 they were having IAS 1. The only difference was they were calling it international accounting standard we were calling it accounting standard even the number was also the same in this case for this particular standard. But for end AS now we have got a new name new number for it end AS 1. But for this converged IFRS the nomenclature has been changed. Now the new nomenclature is presentation of financial statements. It is now presentation of financial statements. We do not call it disclosure of accounting policy. Now we call it converged IFRS uh, you know uh, is named as presentation of financial statements. AS2 which was talking about valuation of inventory earlier for that corresponding international standard was IAS2 even the number was the same and now for un under converged IFRS we only call it inventories. We do not call it valuation of inventories although we do uh, we are actually doing the valuation only we are telling prescribing the rules for valuation only. But now the converged IFRS does not you know assign it a name of valuation of inventories now it calls it inventories and the new number for it is in AS2. The most popular one AS3 accounting standard number 3 which was for cash flow statements. Now, this is this was something which I was telling you at the very outset AS3 was you know accounting standard 3 for our you know country for Indian scenario when we were preparing cash flow statement uh, you know in examination question also it was written that you have to prepare cash flow statement as per AS3 guidelines. Now, it is in AS7 but remember Earlier, you know, the IFRS number corresponding IFRS or corresponding international accounting standard for this was numbered at 7. And now this difference has been eliminated under NDS. Also, we have numbered it in AS 7, which is for statement of cash flow. AS 4 was events occurring after the balance sheet date, uh, you know, here under NDS 10, we have events after the reporting period. So, you must be witnessing that there is a slight change into the uh, nomenclature of converged IFRS also. But if you look at the new name, you will understand that the, the header itself, the name itself indicates what it is going to talk about. Events after the reporting period. So, unnecessary use of you know uh, uh, words they, they have been avoided earlier. It was events occurring after the balance sheet date. Now, we are saying why only balance sheet? Why not profit and loss account? Somebody may ask a question, sir, AS4 was talking about events occurring after the balance sheet date. So, it means we are not talking about the final account, we are not talking about the profit and loss account. It is saying that whatever is your reporting period, after that reporting period, whatever events are that you have to report. If we move ahead again under AS12, it was for accounting for government grants. Uh, corresponding IAS was num numbered at 20. Now, we have NDS 20 for that. This is very important for those who go for government audit because the converged IFRS for it is accounting for government grants and disclosure of government assistance. Earlier, it was only talking about accounting for government grants. Now, it is talking about not only accounting for government grants, but also for disclosure of government assistance, which increases transparency which actually makes it more transparent when it comes to government accounting. AS 13 accounting for investment it was an IFRS number for that was IAS 40 and IAS you know uh, 27 under that investment we have now two converged two sets of converged IFRS one talks about investment property another talk talks about separate financial statements. So, NDS 40 and NDS 27 these two are basically dealing with accounting for investments. So, this is this is the way it has been implemented. I will not uh, you know go for explaining every standard because time does not permit us you know to go that long because if I take up one IFRS and uh, you know start telling you about the interpretations it will take too long and it is not feasible also to tell you. So, wherever it is needed and whatever is needed that will be telling you uh, so that you should have a fair idea about what is there into IFRS and, and you can understand right. Now, I will tell you about what is different into into NDS? What are the salient features of NDS? What has changed? Is it only a change of numbering or nomenclature or, or something more than that has, has, has taken place? Answer is you know there is a metamorphical change into our accounting system. 
with this and that is why it demanded for a lot of you know customization lot of training process and that is why we we needed to have a road map for implementation of this because had it been merely a change in nomenclature what is the need of having a road map you could have implemented so some of the key you know changes which are there which you will witness into the ifrs which i uh, personally feel that it need to be elaborated with some example which i am going to do in this lecture that what is substance over form now we talk about not only valuation we talk about fair valuation approach earlier we were talking about calculating depreciation deciding the method of depreciation and charging it from profit and loss account now we talk about component based depreciation suppose if i take example of one plant one plant is having different components so do you think that each component is having the same life answer is no tire is having different life glass materials they have different life uh, you know steel material they have different life leather is having different life electrical items they have different life and what we were doing earlier we were taking the total cost of your car and dividing it by the life of that car computing the depreciation was it fair answer is no so this component based depreciation it has been propagated it, it has been you know inserted under the ifrs to make it more uh, you know realistic people used to talk about the valuation of inventory but what about the fair valuation how to go for uh, you know evaluating the uh, the value of a particular inventory or a particular uh, you know uh, asset at a fair valuation method what is principle based standard and what is rule based standard i'll tell you a very interesting story for that what is principle based and what is rule based standard what is substance over form so let us now first try to understand what are the salient features of ifrs converged indias remember you have to i'm i'm repeating it time and again so that you should not have this this confusion that we have implemented ifrs we have actually converged with the ifrs and we in india we call it as ind as that is indian accounting standards so we now propagate we talk about principle based standards in place of rule based standard we talk about which is applicable on separate as well as consolidated financial statements if you are consolidating two financial statements that is applicable on that also and remember this you know indias converged ifrs or you can say indias for india it is giving greater importance to the concept of substance over form which is actually the economic reality of a transaction that is very important for us to understand we rely more or or increasingly on fair valuation approach and measurements based on time value of money and we need more disclosures of all relevant informations and assumptions used so to be very precise you know these are you know the the basic changes which we will actually we are witnessing under I, the regime of ifrs it requires higher degree of judgment and estimate now let me start with this uh, uh you know the first concept that uh, what is this uh, rule based and principle based i'll give you a very small example one of my student asked me sir what is rule what is principle suppose if we take instance of a, a railway ticket counter and on that counter in order to maintain the discipline it is written that you have to come in queue this is called this is what this, is it rule or it is principle it is rule this rule has been implemented to ensure that there is no chaos at the ticket window at the ticket counter suppose a booking clerk is sitting and everybody is you know coming like uh, that that everybody is inserting his hand in the counter and saying give me ticket give me ticket will the person be able to book the ticket answer is no so to maintain the discipline what happened there was a rule that you have to come in queue but what is the principle we have to understand do you think that uh, you know standing in queue is a prerequisite or is the integral part of ticket booking process answer is no if you are doing it online there is no need to go even even go to the counter and uh, uh, you know fill the form there and and talk to the that that uh, clerk there but what is the motive motive was to ensure the discipline but what if imagine i'll give you ex an example when the principle based standard is 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 superseded by the rule based standard what if there is no person at the counter you are the only one to take the ticket and the booking clerk says that sir look at the rule what is written there it is written there that you have to come in queue so i will not give you ticket unless the queue is formed unless two three people are there and there is a there is a queue i will not give you ticket if the ticket clerk is you know uh, imposing this kind of condition uh, you know on you then obviously he is talking about the rule based you know uh, rule based standard it's not principle based 
So, in accounting, this is what we are actually, you know, expecting. We, this is actually what we are expecting from business entities to adopt. That in place of conventional rule-based standards, you should have a principle-based standard. A rule is there that you have to come in queue. But what if there is no other person? You are the only person to take the ticket. So, you should give ticket to the person. You should not wait for the queue to be formed. So, this is, this is uh, an example which can, uh, you know, give you uh, an understanding of what is rule based and what is principle based. Now, I will tell you about, uh, you know, how to go for understanding NDS. NDS are basically based on, uh, based increasingly on substance over form. Now, substance and form, which is all, which was earlier known as, you know, prudence under, uh, you know, our Indian gap that is generally accepted accounting principle. Suppose I give you an example, sale of goods on extended credit terms. You are a seller, you are selling goods to your customer on extended credit terms, which means you are giving extra credit to your customer. Normally, you are offering a credit of say one month to all the customers and there is a new customer who is demanding for a credit of uh, four, five, six months or more than what usually you are offering. Now, what will happen? If you are offering credit for the extra period, obviously, you will be charging some, some interest, some fin financing element has to be there, which is inbuilt in the price that need to be segregated. And remember, that need to be considered as interest income. Suppose if the price for one month credit is say 100 rupees and for, uh, you know, uh, six month credit it is 110, then 10 rupees is what? 10 rupees actually belongs to interest. That need to be segregated under in days, what you call as converged IFRS. So, say goods normally sold at price of rupees 100 for 3 months credit and if you are selling at rupees 110 for 15 months credit, what will, what will happen? You will have to segregate, which earlier we were not doing. Rupees 10 need to be considered as interest income and remember, my dear learners, this has not only, uh, you know, uh, uh, no, this has not only the implication for segregating, you know, the interest income and, and the selling price of the product, but it has also the GST and TDS implications. What is TDS tax deduction at source? So, when we talk about the goods and services tax, which is known as GST, since I am talking about India's Indian scenario, that's why I'm telling you about GST and TDS implications. So that GST need to be charged on that. You are actually having, you know, the interest income. So that interest income need to be segregated. Fixed assets or inventories which are purchased on deferred credit terms having financing element, for them also it is said that you have to segregate, you know, the interest from the purchase price. Most of the time when, when you buy your car, you are having an extended warranty. And for that warranty also you are paying. So, remember that warranty price which you are paying, that is not a, the part of purchase price that need to be segregated. And that is why nowadays when you go for buying a car, your dealer is not giving you one invoice comprising of everything. They are offering you the invoice for the price of car in a, on a separate, in a separate invoice. The, the billing is done for extended warranty in a separate invoice. For insurance, there is a separate invoice because every invoice is going to invite some GST. So, what is the implication to it? Implication is what would be the original cost of fixed assets and inventories for tax. So, to, to make it more clearer, to make it more transparent, what we talk about, what we talk now, we talk about substance over form. So, we have to basically do what? We have to unbundle, you have to go for unbundling of multiple elements from the selling price wherever it is needed and this is what it says. That do not go by the form that customer has paid the selling price. Go by the substance, whether the customer is paying for the price for the price of the car or the customer is paying for the extended warranty. So, an automobile dealer, you know, sells a car for extended warranty of three years instead of normal one year, then obviously you have to segregate this component of, uh, you know, extended warranty from the selling price and obviously that is going to be a, uh, you know, fair way of dealing with it. So, this was the first salient feature of our, uh, uh, rather uh, second salient feature of India's. I told you about the substance over form. I told you about the principle based and rule based principles of accounting. I will be, you know, discussing, uh, you know, in detail some more, uh, you know, key features or salient features of India's in next lecture of mine. With this, I am ending today's lecture. Thank you so much.